And welcome to a Wednesday night Bible study here at Faith and Victory Church. So glad to have you. <coughs> God is good. Amen. All the time. So uh, hope you're having a wonderful and blessed day. And uh, remember that Jesus is Lord. We're continuing in our series on uh, faith foundations. And we trust you'll be continue to be ministered to as we do this. You can go ahead and share this on Facebook if you want to. Invite your friends and get them involved. Amen. <coughs> Last week we were talking about um, faith versus feelings. This week we're moving into what does it mean to believe with the heart? What does it mean to believe with the heart? Praise God. Look at Romans chapter 10, if you will. Romans 10, 10. And Paul writes, says, for with the heart man believeth, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so Paul declares that with the heart man believeth, the heart man believeth. Look at John 3. John chapter 3. Starting in verse 3. John writes and says, uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, or born anew, or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you that you must be born again. Praise God. And then if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth. Paul writes and talks about a... Um, Believing with the heart. So what are we talking about here? Well, um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we get a little more clarity here. Uh, down in verse 23, where Paul writes uh, to the church of Thessalonica and says this, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, completely. Um, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Your whole spirit, soul, and body. Well, in the Greek, these are three different words. One is spirit, pneuma. Uh, the second is soul, which is a suke. And then the uh, body, which is soma, your soma. And so we have here... Paul, Paul saying that he would, uh, wants God to sanctify us wholly, completely, in all three realms of man's existence. Man is a triune being. He is spirit, soul, and body. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and even after the, you know death and we're separated from the body and we, we go to be with the Lord, we come and we receive our glorified bodies. Corruption shall put an incorruption, mortal shall put an immortal mortality. Um, and... Um, we are once again complete with an eternal body at that point, glorified, resurrected body. Because God intended for us to be spirit, soul, and body. So the spirit of man, um, referred to as the heart, referring to this, you know, we and the word heart became was was used to reference the uh, the center, the core, the innermost part of man, um, just like the heart of a tree in the in the, in the center of a tree. Um, the heart of the matter, the very core. And so the word heart became interchangeable with spirit in the sense that it's talking about the very center, the very essence of man. So man is a spirit. I love the way Brother Hagin defined it. Man is a spirit. He lives in a body. I mean, um, he possesses a soul, he lives in a body. He possesses a soul and lives in a body. The soul of man is the mind, the will, the intellect, the emotion, the mental seat of man. It is the um, conduit, as it were, 
between the spirit and the body, between the spirit realm and the natural realm, um, by pa uh, passes through man's mind. Hallelujah. Um, in the Old Testament now, um, oftentimes, because that revelation in regards to man being spirit wasn't quite clear yet, um, they use those terms interchangeably, spirit, soul, spirit, soul. He that win the souls is wise. We understand they were really winning spirits to the Lord and New Testament doctrine. Um, but, you know, not all things were revealed. They, they walked in the light they had at the time. So, to believe with the, with the heart is to believe out of your spirit man. That is the part of man that was created in the image of God. Amen? Um, we contact God in our spirit, with our spirit. 1 John 4. Look back over there, if you will. 1 John chapter 4. I'm running to John 4, and I'm, I'm supposed to be in 1 John. No, John 4. John 4, not 1 John. John 4. My next scripture is 1 Corinthians. I, was, I picked up that extra extemporaneous one there. 4, verse 24. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Boy, does that really address some stuff going on in the church world today. We, we could spend a month there, that can't, couldn't we? Uh, how much of our worship is fleshly and carnal? How much is spiritual? Because they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. We don't need carnal substitutions for what God said must be done in the spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Well, it'll bless you anyhow. Amen. Glory to God. So let's just, you know, make, make sure we understand where do we worship God out of our spirit? It's easy um, because the book of 1 Corinthians tells us over in 1 Corinthians, looking for chapter 14. I'm sorry, I meant to go to Hebrews 4. I'm, I'm, I, I was diverting away from, from my written notes and was going to run over to Hebrews 4 real quick. Because it makes a point here. Because you know, some people say, well, the spirit and the soul are the same thing. Well, um, Hebrews 4, verse 12, states, for the word of God is quick, that is a living thing. And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, of the suki and the, and the um, numa, and of the joints and the mara, and as a discerner and thoughts and intents of the heart. Glory to God. I said glory to God. So, if the word of God can divide the spirit and the soul, then they're not the same. They're not the same part of man. They're, they are different entities in man different parts of his makeup. And um, the spirit of man is his heart. That's the inner part. That's the most, um, that is the deepest innermost part of man. The one that was created in the image of God. The one that is to worship God. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Glory to God. I think sometimes when we um, relegate our worship uh, to carnal worship, you know, things that that sound good or, you know, uh, make our flesh happy and, and get excited because we were, you know, we were really grooving at the the church rock and roll concert instead of worshiping God. Um, we sell people short of the true experience they're supposed to be having because you're to be communing with God in your spirit. We're to be in in in. in spiritual intimacy with God. Now that can be that, that, that the rhythm of the music um, doesn't necessarily um, thwart or change that as much. Um, but when we, we offer a carnal means 
and call it Christian worship. We, we really need to back up and say, are we, are we doing Christian entertainment and performance? Are we really, trying to, are we really worshiping God? Because we don't want to confuse people and get them to think that what they're doing in the flesh out of a carnal thing that's really not creating intimacy with God um, is the same thing as worshiping him in spirit. Until our spirits are involved, until our spirits are in tune, until actually the spirit is leading the worship and not our spirit. I'm talking about ours, not, not the Holy Spirit. We're in communion with him, but until our spirits are ascending and we're not approaching this from a carnal thing, uh, we're missing the mark. We really are missing the mark. And uh, I've heard all kinds of arguments pro, for, why, yada, yada, yada. Bottom line is, we should be worshiping in spirit and in truth. That's what the word says. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And um, if I can get a help me, Jesus, that'll help. You know, or dear Lord, I didn't know that was that, you know, whatever. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So. Hebrews 4.12 says the spirit can be divided from the soul. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people say things because it sounded good to them mentally. But in reality, it wasn't spiritual. It takes the word of God to separate that. And um, if we do not adhere to the word of God, we will miss that. First Corinthians 14, 14, Paul says, uh, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my, my spirit prayeth. Hallelujah. But my understanding is unfruitful. What's his understanding? His soul. But praying in tongues is of, is, a, is of his spirit. It's not of his mind. It's of his spirit. God gave us a language where our spirit could pray and commune and fellowship and have contact with God. Um, I like to say this is our spirit uh, in communion with the father of spirits. Hallelujah. With utterances that our mind doesn't understand. How be it in the spirit? He speaketh mysteries. He speaketh mysteries. Amen. Glory to God. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1. So uh, we need to understand that the spirit of man is the inner part of man, the most, the, the God's, the, uh, what we refer to often as the inward man. So um, Dad Hagen used to say this. He said, with my spirit, I contact the spiritual realm. With my soul, I contact the intellectual realm. And with my body, I contact the physical realm. Well, amen. Hallelujah. But God is a spirit. You're not going to contact God with your flesh. You're not even going to contact God with your mind. They that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. How important is for us to understand the nature of man that the heart of man is the inward man, the real man, the part that communes, fellowships, uh, interprets God, understands God, all done in the realm of the spirit. Praise God. Hallelujah. So this inward man, let's look at this inward man, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. For which cause we faint not, though the, our outward man perish, that's the body, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Glory to God. You know, though, though the body may decay, the inward man is strengthened. Though the body may decay, the inward man grows. Though the body may decay, the inward man uh, becomes a stalwart giant for God. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse 27. Now well, we can back up here just a little bit. Verse 24. Know ye not that they which run a race all... Uh, in a race, run all, but one receive with the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. 
Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep, uh, but I, you understand that? I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, wow. Wow. Does that nail the narrative that it doesn't matter what you do, your spirit and your saved, and it doesn't matter? Paul says here, he, the preacher of grace, as people call him, with the revelation of grace that he had, says he keeps his body under and brings it into subjection, lest that by any means when he had preached to others, he would be a castaway. By what? Not keeping his body under. But notice he said, I. <clears throat> Who is this I? It's the inward man. Keeping the outward man under. Keeping the outward man that perisheth under. Amen. And so he says here, I keep my body under. So he's really giving us a clue here that the spirit of man is the part of man that is to reign and govern our existence. Now you understand, I understand a spirit in communion with God, following after the plan of God, following after the purposes of God, following the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. But it is the spirit of man and not your flesh. And we do so much to placate and appease the flesh, making people think that that is a walk with God, when in reality, the walk is in the spirit. Amen. We're to be led by the spirit. We're to live in the spirit. Amen. It is our spirit that is alive unto God. Your body, is, your body unless Jesus comes back before, the, before you die physically, you're going to die physically. It's decaying. Now, the rate of decay is, can be um, modified by the, how much life of God you're living in and walking in and um, the way you live your life in the spirit. Uh, had somebody interesting, somebody that uh, we were talking about our 45th year. This is our 45th year since I graduated from high school. And um, they wrote, somebody wrote, and, and I, put, I said something on that feed, and somebody wrote back and said, Ed Taylor, you look the same. You haven't changed a bit. You've been preserved well. I said, God has preserved me. God has kept me. And, you know, you know living, living with God will do that for you. Hallelujah. You know, I've seen people who lived a rough life, and they, at 25 and 30 years old, look like they've been drugged through the mud, the flood, the blood, and every other kind of ud. And I rode hard and put up wet too many times. But the life of God will keep you. The life of God will sustain you. Life of God will keep you younger. Amen? Hallelujah. But eventually, that body's just going to, you know, you're going you're gonna to wear it out. Eventually. Now, we can, we can delay that, how, how quick it happens, but we, it's still going to happen. Because the inward man is what's being renewed. The outward man perisheth. The inward man is renewed day by day. So Paul says, I keep my body under. The inward man keeps the flesh under. Praise God. Can somebody out there say amen? Hallelujah. Uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 12. We're establishing the fact that man is a spirit. That is his highest order. That is his highest existence. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, or that ye, ye, present your bodies. He didn't say present yourselves, he said present your bodies. A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable. And my margin says this. And I really don't know why King James used the word reasonable. But the margin says spirit. And that's what the Greek word really does trans, uh, 
bear out uh, spiritual, which is your spiritual service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But notice he says he wanted them to present their bodies. It's like, you know, saying, hey, I want you to present your car at the car show. You know, my car is not me. My body is not me. I live in it. Hello? When they, when they, put, my, when they put my body in the ground, I won't be here. Hello? We, we go to funerals, and yeah, I know we use this term all the time. We've done it for so long. Uh, it's on tombstones. Rest in peace. That had to be established before you ever that took your last breath. Because um, the only rest in peace is going to be if you were born again. Hello? You know, rest in peace. Rest in peace. It, it's, it's a thing we say that really has no biblical uh, substantiation or whatever to say when somebody passes away. Hello? We're putting their body in the ground, but their spirit left the moment they died. The moment they physically died, their spirit left that body. If they were born again, they went to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And if they didn't, they went to hell. And I know that's harsh, and that's, but it's, it's the truth of the Bible. That's why we're to get people saved. That's why we're to preach the gospel. That's why to go out to the hearts of men. Because, because the ultimate um, consequences are either good or bad. There's no in-between. There is no purgatory to go hang out and see if you can't work it out and get better. If you're a believer, when you're absent from the body, you're with the Lord. If you're an unbeliever, to be absent from the body means you go to hell. Your spirit, not your flesh, your spirit. Your spirit goes. There is a day we're coming back and getting our bodies, a glorified, resurrected body. But until then, our spirit is with the Lord. Glory to God. Second Corinthians chapter five. Looking at um, verse, I believe it was 16. Let me look, look, look real quick again. Verse one, I'm sorry. It was a six. It was verse one, verses six through eight. Listen to this. Second Corinthians five, one. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. Our earthly house. It's talking about your body. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Um, verse 6. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So he's, he's saying that when you're, when you're present in the body, you're absent from the Lord. When you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. He's making it very clear that the spirit of man is the eternal existent part that um, the body without the spirit's dead. But the spirit without the body is not dead. It doesn't cease to exist. It goes, it continues on. So man is a spirit. Hello, the inward man. First Peter chapter three. First Peter three. Verse four. Now, this, I know this is talking about women, but it, there's, there's still this thing here. You know, verse 4. Let it be the hidden man of the heart. And that which is not corruptible, even ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great peace. Notice he refers to that inner man, that inner person as the hidden man of the heart. <clears throat> and then Romans chapter 7. In verse 22. Romans 7. In verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So there's enough scriptures here that we were referring to a part of man is referred to as the inward man. Um, that it is the eternal existent part of man. 
that it will continue without the body. Um, it, you know, that it can continue without the body. It will continue without the body. It is the core of who we are, our spirits. Praise God. Now, the soul and the spirit may stay in intact. And they do stay intact. Luke 16, um, we know this parable. Of, actually, it's not, uh, it's not a parable because Jesus said there was a certain rich man. But Luke 16, verse 19, and there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. <clears throat> and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with crumbs that fell from the man, rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his wounds. And it came to pass that the beggar died, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in cold water and cool my tongue. And I, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Besides this, between us and you, there's a great gulf. So that they which would pass from hence to, uh, to you cannot, and neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Hallelujah. So we have here um, the soul, the mind, the will, the intellect, the emotions, the awareness of, of existence, which is in the soul, remained intact with the spirit when, the body, when it left the body. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 we talked about already. How that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. So uh, man will stay intact, spirit and with his soul. Hallelujah. And um, they stay together, but they are not the same. Because they can be divided, they can be separated. Hallelujah. Uh, spiritual things are just as real as natural things. The word of God is the key to heart faith. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In case you're wondering, that's right before 2 Corinthians. That was a heavy rev, you want it? Come on, somebody. That's got to be at least partially funny. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, looking in verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, going back to what we said earlier about, you know, carnal worship and that kind of, we call it worship but it's just car, it's carnal something if we're placating the natural man and not engaging the spirit of man then the things of God are going to be foolishness to him because they are spiritually discerned the Bible says that the carnal mind's enmity against God. Hello? That it can't understand the things of God. Oh my. We, we begin to focus, and we used to, but I think we need to go back to it in the body of Christ. Spiritual, man being a spirit, and um, not, not satisfying the needs of a carnal generation's fleshly desires because what they really need is a spiritual awakening and new and rebirth and an awareness that their spirit can be alive unto God and com and have communion with God in their spirit. Amen. Thank you for your enthusiasm. All those watching can send me an amen out there. Amen. 
So the word is spiritually understood. It is not going to be understood with your natural mind. Um, I talk with people, and they're so bent on using their natural mind to understand, understand spiritual things. They're all messed up. They're all over the place. You know, one, one was telling me not re too long ago that they believe Adam and Eve was just a symbolic thing. There were many Adams and Eves all over the world. I said, that won't line up with New Testament theology. Because sin passed on to all men by one man. And, of course, they say, well, we can agree, disagree, and they didn't want to continue to espouse his own view, which he had no intention of hearing mine. Um, and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not wasting my time. You go ahead and talk. I'm done. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and, and um, you know, exchange banter with you because you've already made up your mind. You're just trying to share your your intellectual whatever. And you don't know your head from a hole in the ground. Um, there weren't many Adams and Eves. There was one. Because when Adam sinned, it passed on to all mankind. Had there been many, that would have meant that he would have he would have horizontally passed his sin to everybody. And that wouldn't have been true. You could have had a line that didn't sin, but that's not true. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So uh, when, you try to, when you try to reason the Bible with your natural mind, then you're going to get all confused. And you're, going, you're just going to get messed up because you're going to begin to come up with ideas and, and philosophical approach. You can't philosophically approach the Bible. It is spiritually understood under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the teacher of the church, of which there is no private interpretation. Hello. I said there is no private interpretation. If it's the Holy Spirit, it's going to be the same revelation across the board. In general, I mean, you know, you may see something in, in, in one area a little bit deeper or whatever than where somebody else is. But in the general context of it, it's going to be the same. And they're not going to be opposite or, or opposed to each other. If the Holy Spirit's involved. Amen. You're not going to come up with, you know, the whole theological dissertation of Paul's writings is one man brought sin into the world and another took it all out. And, you know, were there many Jesus is under your under that kind of thinking. Were there many redeemers? Was there a redeemer for each line of the different atoms? See, it's just, it's just, it's fallacy. But that's a carnal mind trying to figure stuff out. And, and, and being uh, intellectual about it. But we, must, we discern the word of God and the truth of God in the spirit. By the teacher un, uh, unveiling his written word to us. Amen. We have this mystery in earthen vessels. Glory to God. That mystery of the new man Christ in you. The hope of glory. Amen. Can I get a shout? Somebody. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen person. From the amen corner. Thank you. And I see some scrolling across the screen there. Don't know who you are, but I'm glad you're doing it. Glory to God. Look at Proverbs 3, the third proverb. Hallelujah. Looking at verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Uh, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now, there you go. Be not wise in your own eyes. Intellectualism, when it comes to the things of God, doesn't work. Now, I'm all for studying the Greek and the Hebrew and, and understanding the shades of meanings of words. But when it's all put together, it was put together by a master planner. When it's all understood, it's understood by the master revealer, the Holy Spirit. 
is understood spiritually. My carnal mind can't figure this stuff out. Hello? And understanding the Trinity takes the work of the Holy Spirit because you certainly can't do it with your head. Hello? Understanding the Spirit. We can't put man's spirit in a test tube and run DNA tests on his spirit and, you know, tell us about his spirit. Can't do it. And we don't need Blair Witch Projects doing it either. Amen? Okay. So, to believe with the heart means to believe in your spirit. When we go to Mark's Gospel, the 11th chapter, which we have done often, because it is a, um, a foundational text that has so much revelation about our walk with the Lord. Verse 20, in the morning as they passed by, Peter calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, the fig tree that thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, have faith in God, or have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Didn't say doubt in your head. Your head can give you a hissy fit. At the same time, in your heart, in your spirit, you know you have the answer. Thoughts may be coming at you a, a, a million a second. But in your heart, you know you have the answer. Glory to God. Shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he said. Notice he said, did not say here, shall not doubt in his mind. Shall not doubt in his thoughts. Shall not doubt in his heart. Now, we do teach and we will continue to teach and we've always taught the importance of renewing the mind and having the mind on board. It's a whole lot easier to believe God when you're thinking right. It really is. It's a, it's a bigger battle when you're, you're struggling and, and going, uh, 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 but my mind, my mind's giving me a hissy fit. Hallelujah. But faith is of the heart. Amen. So we, we need to have, you know, we do need right thinking. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not negating that. But what I am saying is that faith is of the heart. It's not of the head. It is, it is, it is of the heart. Um, E.W. Kenyon once said that there's something that's so similar to faith and so close to faith that um, we have a hard time distinguishing it, and it's called mental assent. And this, and I'll keep going back, you know, I'll keep going back to this, but, you know, it seems to be kind of a thread tonight. If they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth, then it's important that we train people to be aware. Are you here? To be aware of the difference of the mind and the heart. That. Simply agreeing with it mentally doesn't make it faith. You have to believe in your heart. Hello. And by catering to the carnality and catering to the flesh with um, a lot of things that are going on in the body of Christ today, we're training people in carnality. And not teaching them to recognize God in their spirit. So that they can believe God. So that they can walk with God. So that they can commune with God. And understand what is faith and what's not faith in their spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Um, Next week, we'll talk about um, some other things like uh, may, we may get into faith for prosperity. Hallelujah. Um, after that, we get we start getting into the seven steps to the highest kind of faith. Glory to God. Uh, so we're going to be here for a while uh, on this. Uh, we're so glad y'all could take the time out to join us tonight. Glory to God. And um, 
just want you to know we love you. We sure appreciate every time you join with us and spend time with us in the, as we break the word of life. It is our desire and our, and our, our heart that as we, we share these truths, that you grow, that you develop, that you take new steps up in the things of God so that your, your walk with God is one of a deep spiritual walk so that you can uh, understand him, fellowship with him, commune with him, and be a blessing in the kingdom of God. Amen. Um, those that are giving tonight, if you're giving electronically through PayPal or uh, the Cash app, uh, you can go ahead and do that. And we just want you to know how much we appreciate your faithfulness to the, to the work of God. Hallelujah. And uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank all those who tithe and give. We thank you that heaven's windows are open unto them, that you pour out on them blessings. They don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you all for being with us tonight. So happy you could join us. Um, we look forward to being with you again uh, Sunday at uh, 1230. Uh, we're currently meeting and using the uh, New Life Family Church uh, facility on Sunday afternoons. They've graciously opened their doors to us uh, because our meeting place is still closed down to group meetings. Um, a year, 15 months later now, we haven't been able to meet in that facility, but they, they've been so gracious to us for over a year now. We've met there, and um, we're, we're so appreciative of that to their wonderful church family. Praise the Lord. So you can join us at... Um, 6701 Ken Coy Road in High Point, North Carolina, or Jamestown. I think she actually has a Jamestown mailing address, so maybe Jamestown is the um, the address. But um, it's it's near the intersect. It's very close to the intersection of Harvey and Martin Luther King, about a block off of there, and then down a little side road. Um, Twelve thirty service probably starts at one, uh, just because of the time we get in set up and, and get our worship ready. It's one o'clock. Uh, but we'd love to have you be with us in person. Join us. Love to meet you. Love to fellowship with you. And uh, love to bless you in the Lord. Until we meet again, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. We love you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church online.